kids. It's awesome. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Uh, morning, church. <laughs> oh, well, this morning, I just, uh, we're, uh, if you're not aware, we're venturing through Acts, and we're at the end of chapter 2, and uh, it's sort of, if you know what's happened, so the, the Holy Spirit's come, has descended upon the church, and, uh, and it's just like the, the 120 turned into 3,000 overnight, like it just went boom. And it's really cool that we sort of think, oh, so what did that look like? Like, what was the picture of that? And what was the effect of that? And, and Luke, at the end of this chapter, he sort of pauses on the stories and he gives us this overview of, of actually the fruit of what the church actually looked like, what happened in the people's hearts and, um, and what was going on in that, well, in the first weeks, you know, days of the, um, uh, after um, the Holy Spirit coming on the people. And so, uh, yes, yeah, so this five verses here, Acts 2, 42 to 47. So let's, uh, let's read it. So it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Oh, that's quite an incredible picture, isn't it? Like when you actually pause and just uh, read that and just let that kind of imagine that. Um, quite a, an amazing picture of what the fruit of what was going, you know, of the Holy Spirit descending upon the church and the, and the, the, the outworking of that. And I really want to encourage you, like, uh, if you're to uh, get into your word and get into reading, we're in the youth group, we're going through and we're doing what's called cahoots each week, which are like quizzes. And, uh, and so each week we're doing a chapter and, then, and the kids are reading it and, then, and there's chocolate on the line, which is always a good, uh, good motivator. But uh, the acts of the church and the acts of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's like in that first book of, in that book of Acts, there's, there's miracles, there's leadership battles, there's people are stoned, there's riots, there's thousands of people coming to faith. Kids, there's even shipwrecks. Like, it's, it's a cool, it's an amazing book to, to dive into, and that's what we're going through. And, um, and so to think that, you know, that the people's repentance, right, and that, you know, when it said that Paul, uh, when he preached to them at first sort of sermon when they, uh, on Pentecost, that they, they responded and it said they were cut to the heart and they, and they um, repented and believed and got baptized, that, uh, and we see from this that actually they didn't drift off. They didn't, you know, there wasn't sort of a, an ebbing and a, and a sort of a falling away. But actually it was sort of the opposite. They, they, they held on to this awe and wonder of being free, of being set, uh, set free, but being forgiven and being filled continuously by the Holy Spirit. And so it's sort of a picture of this seven-day-a-week church. That, like I was saying, like every day more people were coming to faith, and uh, and you know, and being added to their number, and so I, church didn't really start at Pentecost. Actually, if you think of church as like the people of God, well, it started four thousand years prior. Oh, sorry, four thousand years from us. You know, right back to Abraham, and but the pen, day of Pentecost is when the the remnant of God's people. Um, became like spirit-filled and they became the body of Christ. They became uh, his representatives on earth. And so the question is, I was, is like, what evidences did the church have that of being of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? And when you read that, and there's three things that stood out to me, and, and I guess it's, I want to encourage you that actually the extraordinary is in the ordinary. You know, it is, it's just in the life and doing life. And so the first thing, it says that they were, that they were a learning church. That actually, it, it says that they devoted themselves to, to the teaching of the apostles. And so that word devotion, it, it means like to be committed to, 
to something that they persevered and they pushed through. And, and I bet there were some teachers and some people, you know, it's like, oh man, I really like Peter. But the other ones, oh, I really like the, when John preaches. Or they, maybe they, they, you know, there's different, they had favorites. Or um, some weeks I imagine it wasn't, you know, maybe it wasn't quite as exciting as another week. Or who knows? But there's, but there's this sense of being devoted, of, of persevering, of, of pushing through. And um, I heard one uh, commentator put it like this. It's like uh, that, that Jesus opened a kindergarten for 3,000 people and, uh, and the apostles were the kindergarten teachers. You know? And so it's like they, they got stuck in and they attended every day and they, and they learned what it meant to have faith and they learned from the, um, the apostles to, uh, to steward the Holy Spirit, to, to read the Word and... and you know, and they learned under them what, what it meant, uh, what, Je- what the significance of what Jesus did on the cross. And, and it's like the apostles over that next 30 years or so, they began to write down the stories and they began to write down the teachings and, the, and what happened. And that formed the New Testament. That is the, those stories, the very stories that we're reading today of what was being taught um, by the early apostles and, and what happened as a result. And so they sat um, at human feet and they, they drank it in, they processed it. And so the, ordin- the extraordinary was in the ordinary. And it's like, and, and we hear it in the New Testament too, it goes on and you'll, you'll hear the stories, but the, the miracles and the, uh, and the signs and the wonders and the, um, and the preaching and teaching, it, it rippled out from the apostles. And, and many people who were not part of the 12 apostles the church itself held on to that power, and they, and they preached, and they taught, and, and it was the church that carried it, the body that carried it, and, and, and that's what they picked up through the teaching. And it's, it's so cool that, um, that you know, that's reflected in, in this church, that actually we, we have teachers, and we have preachers, and we have, we have Ignite, and we have youth group, and we have small groups, and, and, and so it's that devotion to teaching that the extraordinary is in the ordinary. So I, I want to encourage you that, that actually the reason why we do what we do is because we are following on from uh, what the apostles did, the same patterns, and, and that's what they did, and that's how the church flourished. And so one of the signs of a, a church, a spirit-filled church, is that they, they were devoted to, the, um, uh, to, to teaching and to walking it out. And that teaching had power. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just head knowledge, it was heart knowledge. It transformed, it changed people's lives and, uh, as, they wo- as they walked it out. And so that's the first thing. And I, I, I remember, uh, I was thinking about this, this term at youth group. We've been doing this st- uh, study on, on the Holy Spirit and, and we put these different uh, promises the Holy Spirit around the room, and we made it a scavenger hunt, and it was sort of like, uh, you know, I promised never to leave you, and so they found that, and they wrote it down, you know, to, or took a photo of it, actually, modern technology, and then they found another, and it was like, I promised to give you peace, and, uh, and there was another one that I promised to teach you, and so they took photos of all these promises, what we found in, around, and then and in groups, we were like, right, so what is it that you need? What is it that, that actually that you need today? And one of the lads was like, man, I, I need self-control. I, like, I just I get so angry at times. And it was incredible watching these young lads, you know, uh, and they just prayed for their mate. And man, and he had tears in his eyes. So, and it's, that's, see, the extraordinary is in the ordinary. It's just doing life with each other and actually having the courage to, to ask questions, to speak out, to pray, to and doing those things, and and they when people see God move and they see lives changed, like man, it's attractive, it's really exciting, and and we carry that power, we carry that because the Holy Spirit is has promised to to be with us, and so that's the first thing is that they were committed to the teaching, and they sat under it, and the second is that they. They, they were committed to doing life together. It says to fellowship. And in the Greek, fellowship, I didn't know this, but fellowship 
means, uh, it means normal life. So it's like they committed to do the ordinary together. They devoted themselves to doing ordinary life together. And that, that's pretty cool. Like, how ordinary is that? You know, and the extraordinary is in the ordinary. And so they, they hung out together. And so could you imagine? So each day it sounds like that. Or, you know, they had these, or maybe weekly they had these formal meetings. They went up to the Temple Mount and to the uh, like Solomon's Colonnade, which was sort of a pu- big public area. And so they, they probably sat there, they sung, they, you know, someone talked, um, and, they, and they did life. But it's really cool, it also says that they, they met in their homes. And so there was this formal and this informal component. You know, there's part of church where, you know, when you meet as a big group together, well, someone's sort of got to organise it, don't they? And, and someone's got to give some notices and and actually, it's like, well, what are we going to, you know, someone has to organize some songs or some hymns and some, you know, bring some instruments, say. And, and the bigger the church, the more structure you kind of need. Um, and yet, so they had that component, but then they had this other compo- component, this informal part, where people just met in their homes, which had total freedom, you know, and flexibility, and, and people could try new things. And I know for me, when I was first, um, first started out and, and running youth group and that, and that sort of thing, um, myself and uh, Jesse and Samara and Lynn, um, we, we, all, we sort of thought it'd be really awesome to pray for the youth in the community, pray for 24-7 and pray for what's going on. And so, so we just met. And, and, and actually, you know, we didn't, have, we didn't advertise it to everyone. We didn't, you know, no one needed to know. Uh, we just... We just, on our hearts, thought, you know what, actually, it'd be so cool to just pray into the, into the you know, into what was happening. And, and so that's what happened. We did that for a, for a few years. And so, and for me, actually, it, it gave me a lot of courage and uh, um, a lot of experience at sort of, you know, praying publicly. It's really weird when you hear your own voice start up when you're praying. Like, it's kind of a, it's a I, I found that a real weird, you know, it was a bit of a roadblock for me. But in that small setting, like you can you can get over your fears and get over your your um, you know try things out and and you, you've got flexibility to um, to ha- you know there's adventure in that in that place and so there was both the formal and the informal and it's cool right from the beginning they had that and and as a church we do that as well you know that there's nothing stopping people getting together and. And whether it's going off for a hike, you know, and inviting friends and, and enjoying nature and, and, and doing a dev- devo up on the top of the hills or something, or, or whether it's fixing a car together, or, you know, it can be all of those things. And you can, and there's flexibility in it. And, uh, and there's power in it. There's the extraordinary in the ordinary. And so I really encourage you that, you know, sometimes we can have churches, you know, we can get a little bit sort of critical of, and, and, and we can get judgmental about different things. And a lot of it really boils down to church size. So I remember some people love church with 30 people, you know, because everyone knows each other and everyone's looking out for each other because you can know, you know, you could, the whole 30 could go and hang out at someone's house and have a barbecue, you know, and it's great. And and, but there's times where it's like, man, there's no one who can sing <laughs> in that 30 people, you know. And, and so there's a limited amount of uh, resources available. But if you have a church of 100, well, you know, there's often, there's a few musicians in there, right? But, but you can't always know everyone in a church of 100, you know. And, and so you cannot necessarily feel completely connected. And, and go to a church of 500 and... Well, and that's a whole different dynamic again, isn't it? You can have professional people who are on staff who lead worship and who just, uh, you know, who are playing every day, you know, and, and what a church of 500 can do um, is, you know, they have resources and, and, uh, and they can have, they can put on, uh, you know, run courses or create courses and do things that a church of 30 can't. But in a church of 500, like, don't expect to know the pastor personally. Like they're, they're not going to know 500 people personally. So they're not going to be able to 
visit 500 people. Um, I went to a church at HTB, which is in London, or it's called Holy Trinity Brompton, and, uh, and that's the home of Alpha, and uh, they have four services a day, and it's in this old Anglican sort of cathedral, and it's all built of stone, and um, it's sort of got huge history, you know, and you're, and you're sort of looking around pillars, and, you know, and, the, and the, um, the actual church is probably about, you know, sort of, it's actually not probably even as wide as this, but it's about three times as long, you know, and you're also like, you're looking over here trying to see what's happening, you know, and the, and the gallery up top, you know, it's about 40 degrees up there because the heat all goes up, you know, and, and uh, but man, they, they run this, you know, this sort of home of Alpha, and, and they have this worldwide, you know, ministry, and it's amazing. And the, and the two years that I went there, I, I met Nicky Gumbel once. I had a conversation with him once, and that was it. I remember times you'd go to a service, and, uh, and you'd, you'd not see the person sitting beside you for, you know, a year later. You know, you'd be like, oh, bro, you know, I do remember vaguely I sat beside you about six months ago, you know. And so there's this totally different dynamic that happens in churches. And, and, uh, but in it all, right, there's still this, this sense of doing life together. And that, that might look differently, and it might look in uh, small groups, and, um, it's, but it's, it's still the same heart, there's still the same ethos, and uh, you've got to find where you fit and where you uh, works for you. And the church size that, that, you, um, you know, that, you're, that you're a part of. And there's, there's always pros and cons, no one's, nothing's going to be perfect. And, and I imagine all of that dynamic was happening too in the early church. You know, it was probably the first mega church, <laughs> 3,000. Like, it would, uh, it would be, you know, a, um, a pumping place. But there's this, this, this unity that happened in that church as well, in that first church. And that they, they were united over, over Jesus. And they were of one heart and one accord, and they were devoted to each other. And, and I was talking to Greg about that, and, and he, he um, shared a story. He was just telling me about this Warriors coach, Andrew Webster, who's the, he's really turned around the team, you know, and they've done an amazing uh, job of, uh, they're in the top eight, you know, and they're really looking to get into the finals this year. They're on track for that. And, and everyone's asking him, like he's, it's really significant that, you know, the change in the work ethic and the, the players, everyone's, you know, the, in terms of the NRL, are really, you know, it's really noted. And this guy's on for Coach of the Year award, potentially, and, and he was in an interview, and they were asking, like, what's changed? Like, what's, what's shifted? And, uh, and Greg was saying, that actually, his response was that, actually, as the team, the biggest change, and, um, Andrew Webster's response, is that the players are sticking to the game plan. And, uh, and he said, it's like, you know, it may have, you know, because I guess, you know, depending on the team you're against, uh, every, every team's got strengths and weaknesses. So they're like, right, well, we're going we're gonna to do this. You know, our strategy to bypass their defense might be to go wide, you know. Maybe it's kicking to the corners or something. So they practice that all week. And then you can imagine a halfway through the game, and it's like, oh, man, this, they've got our number. It's not quite working. You know, it's, we didn't think we'd, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's tougher than they were expecting. And, what, and he's saying that rather than individuals going, you know, we're just going to try something different and just going off and doing their own thing, they, they're sticking to the game plan, even though it wasn't necessarily the perfect, you know, it turned out in real life on the field, it's, it's not working quite the way they wanted. Uh, but the, the players, they're realising actually they've got the best chance of winning is sticking to what they've been trained to do. And he's like, that's the, that's the biggest thing. He reckons it's shifted. And I thought, well, isn't that a, like, wow, that's quite a, a, uh, you know, a, a, a team of incredibly highly trained athletes where actually, you know what, we're going we're gonna to stay united as a team and we're going to work together and, uh, and stay to the game plan. And it's that sort of sense of unity that I believe that early church had. You know, and that doesn't mean that you can't change things, but, it, but they had this, this, um, this, they were of one accord and uh, they, they loved the, the Lord, and the unity came from their heart and their faith and their, um, uh, and, and their unity and, and being filled with the Spirit and, 
loving each other, loving the church, loving people. And that unity, you know, in the Bible, it talks about it commands a blessing. And it's pretty cool that in nowhere, I, I remember, you know, traveling around the world, we've been to a lot of countries, and you can, it doesn't matter where you are, you can walk into a church, and it's like, oh, you know, there's a sense of coming home. You know, whether it's, I remember going to Russia, where you couldn't, didn't have a clue what they were saying, and there's, in the Russian, Russian Orthodox Church, there's no, there's no uh, instruments, it's all just choir, men's choir, and and it was incredible, like, like the sound just in the, you know, it was just this beautiful service that we kind of, we were sat in. And people would smile and wave and, you know, and, and they would say something in Russian and you would, you know, you'd say something back. And, but there was this unity in, of spirit there that, that um, we have as a people of God that we've got to hold on to. And, uh, and that's attractive, and another fruit of the church being filled with the Spirit was that they ate together, they fellowshiped together. And uh, I, th- I didn't quite appreciate really th- thinking about the, you know, putting our, our kitchen right in the center of the church. You know, it's access from the foyer, it's access to the, and, and, sorry, into the hall, into the foyer. You know, it's just a few meters from this auditorium. And, and realizing that while that making, you know, food a central thing that actually people love food. You know, I love food. You know, we, when you invite people in, in, over and you ask them, hey, do you want to stay for a couple? Or do you want to, you know, we're going to get some food out. Do you want to hang around? People will stay. People will stay for food. And, and some of the best conversations you have are around food. It says that the church, that they broke bread together. And so that was a... Um, that was part of that was um, uh, the formal part of the meal of actually having communion together, you know, to recognize the breaking of the bread, symbolic of Jesus, uh, you know, his, his body broken for us. But there was, there was a greater sense that they fellowshiped and they, and they ate together and, that, and there was a formal part of the meal and an informal part. And some of the best conversations I've had have been over food. And I, I remember, and I, was, I was thinking to myself, like, oh, like, What's some like way out there conversations I, you know, that I've had, and 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 I realised it's like my goodness, it happened over food. I was in uh, one time I, I went tramping, and I was in Arthur's Pass, and I was in what was called the Minga Hut, just, and, and that's right at the top of the pass between the Minga and the Deception Rivers. So the Deception goes down to the west coast, and it's like this full-on rainforest rugged as river, you know, with house, uh, sorry, boulders the size of cars, like they're huge, and it's sort of, and then on the Minga side, on the east side, it's just like over 500 metres, it just turns into tussock, and, and uh, like what you'd find on the, you know, walking up around Mount Oxford, it's sort of, it's got that east coast, east side um, forest, and I'm sitting in there, and we, we got into this hut, and there was these two guys who were, um, got into the huts before us, and so it's basically, you know, a first in, first serve, and these two guys were um, walking around <coughs> and doing that, you know, getting their room ready, etc., and so we got in there and did the same, and and uh, and then we got chatting over cooking dinner together, we were, you know, everyone got to get out their little cookers, and it turns out they were American, and uh, and then it turns out that these two guys flew F-16 fighter jets. And I thought, like, what the heck? How, like, what's the chances of meeting real-life Top Gun fighter pilots in a tiny little hut back or beyond, you know, in, in New Zealand? And uh, we had this conversation with them, and they were telling us about, they, they flew in Iraq in the, over 1991, and the, you know, the, um, the Iraq war. And they were telling me about their flying these planes over the desert and trying to track down tanks and this, that and the other. And I was like, it was just so surreal, you know. And you, don't, you just don't know who you're sitting beside. You don't know people's, often people's stories. And it's incredible the richness and the joy of community when you fellowship with people. And so the extraordinary can happen over food. That's why we do food together. That's why we, we were doing the, you know, the lunches and, and that's why we, wanna, we, we want uh, to fellowship over food going forward. That's why we want to invest in and create this 
kitchen that can be used seven days a week. And uh, we can, I've got my donut maker in there, which was slowly polishing up and getting ready. And um, I showed the boys, the youth on Friday night, they're like, oh, it looks a bit greasy, you know. And I was like, guys, it's okay, you know, you have eaten donuts out of this donut machine. It was from Easter camp. And they're like, okay, so we haven't died, so that's all right. That's, it's obviously okay, you know. But we're cleaning, cleaning things up and we're preparing. And, and uh, you know, in the not too distant future, we're going to better use it. And I wonder what lives are going to be impacted by the sharing of food, that's going to, the conversations that are going to happen here and in the foyer and outside on the picnic tables. And, and, um, and that's going to happen through conversations that you're going to have with people, prayers that you're going to have with them. You know, and and that's, that was what the early church was about, that they, they talked together and they ate together and they fellowship together and the kids were there and kids love food, youth love food, you know, we all love food and uh, we can do that and, and connect. Another fruit of being filled with the Holy Spirit was that the, was the, it was a church of prayer that they prayed. They were a praying church, they prayed for growth, they prayed for courage to share the gospel, they they prayed that they would not be put off by persecution. They, they, they wanted to have a, um, they, ha- they were an outward looking church. I, mean, I had a chat with, this, uh, with Doug, uh, he was a, a shepherd from uh, Lincoln Baptist, uh, Linwood Baptist, sorry, and he just spends his time walking around now, the streets around Linwood and bumping into people and, and, and talking with them. And, uh, and he, he, one of the things he said is, it, it's just a real simple thing was that as a, when he has a conversation with people, he, he asks he, in the back of his mind, is, is it a sowing conversation or a reaping conversation? And so quite often he would actually say to people, like, and he would ask them about their faith and ask them their journey and that, and, and what they believe, and over meeting these people and on the streets. And sometimes he would just ask them, hey, you know what, uh, like, are you just, are you ready to receive Jesus now? Do you want to? And he was just picking up that maybe t- this is a reaping conversation. And he's in, he couldn't believe the number of times people go, oh, actually, yeah, yeah, I am. You know, and he would say, you know, sometimes we don't actually give people the opportunity to cross the line, to cross the threshold. And actually, people are very open. And uh, I was talking to the builders this week about, you know, about their journey, about what it's like in, back in their country and, and, uh, and we got talking, you know, and had a really great conversation about faith. And actually people want it, and it's the most uh, important conversation you can have, you know, is like, so what happens after death? And so we can be a, we can be a praying church. And, and it's a real simple thing to just have in the back of your mind. Is it a sowing conversation? Can I just sow a, something a little bit more into, into their journey, into their life? Or is it a reaping conversation? Am I here to, to reap something that someone has already sown in over years maybe and have the joy of reaping it? But it just helps to, helps to get intentional. Um, and lastly, I want to... Uh, they, they, they were a church of action. It says in verse 45, it said, They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in need. Every day they continued to, this is in verse 45 and 46, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And, and so there's this, their faith, you know, you know it runs deep when it extends to finances, when it extends to to actually moving past just prayer, but, but it moves into action, it moves into helping people, and it moves into, uh, into maybe collectively sharing possessions, you know, and helping people with life. Um, and this, this idea of selling houses and lands, and maybe because imagine selling your Xbox to raise some money to give it to someone. Like, wow, like, that's... That's next level, isn't it? Like, I oh know Daniel Sam's mouth open. <gasps> <laughs> the thought, but actually, that's 
That was the passion that they had, right? That was the love that they had for people. And it wasn't a foreign concept. Um, the Essenes, that, well, you might have heard of that group of people, they were, the, they were actually the ones that the, had the Dead Sea Scrolls that in the 1960s they found in, in Gedi. And, uh, and there were a whole lot of scrolls they found just in, in the back of caves. Um, and they were, they were from the, these people called the Essenes, uh, a group who lived in community together. And one of the requirements was like, well, if you want to live together and share resources, you, when you came, you gave everything you had to the collective. You sold or gave all your possessions to them, and then you la- lived in community. That was, their, um, that was part of the cost of living together. And so this idea of sharing of possessions was not a foreign thing. Um, but it's interesting that here you see, even in verse 47, it says that they met in homes directly afterwards. So they still had private property. It wasn't like... This verse here is saying that everybody in that, in that New Testament church, everyone just sold everything. No, that people who had a heart, who they felt to free resources. Maybe they had land in the field that they didn't need anymore, or they felt like, actually, I want to sell it and free up the capital and give it to the church. So again, it wasn't this rule. It was something, again, that was moved from their passion and their heart for the Lord and heart for people and the heart to see um, people's needs met collectively, that that out of that passion and that heart that they they sold and shared possessions. And so they were a church of of action. You know, and I I remember times where we've been blessed and back when I was studying in 2010 and we, uh, we gave up my job and uh, for two years, just on the student allowance, which was just, you know, barely covered, um, you know, your groceries and things like that, let alone all your main costs. And, and for two years, we often, were five o'clock at night, someone would just knock on the door and, hey, here's some carrots, you know, here's some veg. Uh, others, people just gave us a few kilos of sausages and just little things. But man, it touched our hearts. Like you have no... No idea how much sometimes the little can impact people. Because it, it, as much as it's is, is, um, you know, meeting a lead, need, it's actually saying, man, I thought about you. Like, I, I care. You know, you're, you're on my heart. And, and so I've come around to deliver something. And so they were a church of action. And, and don't never underestimate what the impact is of, of sharing, of helping people out, of, of changing a tire, you know, of, of whatever it looks like. But actually, action really does speak, you know, a huge amount to people. And it's, so it's in the smallness of the community that the extraordinary happens. It happens in the ordinary. And it happens in life, doing life together. And... And so I just encourage it, like, like me and Greg and Teresa and, uh, and Samara, we can't, you know, feed everyone. We can't check everything. We, can't, we don't know everybody's needs. But as a church, we do. You know, as a church, we can, and as small groups, uh, you, you know what's going on with your neighbours. You know what's going on around the corner. Actually, and this is the thing, uh, uh, this... What was happening in the new church was very organic. It, it wasn't leader-led. It wasn't like Paul was going, right, we need to go, you know, go to this, 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 this place. We need to divvy out this, that, and the other. Actually, it just, people did it on their own volition. People were looking out for each other, and they had a heart for, um, you know, for the community, and, for, and that came out of um, their passion for the Lord. And so it was an outward-focused church. It was a loving church. And so... Those are the three, just three simple things. You know, the, the church, it was a church that, that, that had a, was devoted to teaching and to the Word and to the, the Bible. It was a church that was, had a heart for worship and a heart for um, doing life together, doing the small things. And, and it was a, 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 sorry, and a church of prayer. Three simple things. But in it, the extraordinary happened. 
And, um, and as we read through Acts uh, in chapter 3, you find out about some of those extraordinary things. And it says that the community was in awe of the miracles, of the, of the love that the community had for each other, for the, the way that it looked out for each other. And it's, that's the, isn't that the church that we want to be? Isn't that the church that um, we want to be known for? A church that has a heart for the community, that seven days a week, you know, church that can, loves food, that loves to share, loves to uh, get around people and help each other and to worship God and to steward His presence. So as the team get up, um, I just want to, just want to, yeah, do you want to stand and we'll just pray, um, we'll just pray for that and pray for the courage and the uh, and passion to be able to walk in that ourselves. I encourage you this morning, uh, like if you tonight, it's going to be an awesome night, and it's a night where we're just going to just really centre around um, the goodness of God, you know, and, and who He is, and just pray and to worship, and uh, be a real time to yeah pray for healing, and we want to really go for that tonight, and. And I really believe there's going to be testimonies coming out of that, that, you know, we can share with our neighbours, we can share with our, our friends that, that God's alive, that He's moving, He moves in power, He's transforming lives, and that, um, and that church is an exciting place to be. And so, let's pray. Father, I just, um, Lord, we look at the, the, yeah, the new church, Lord, and have such a passion for you, and we pray for that, Lord. I pray for the courage and the and the passion, the devotion, Lord, to devote ourselves to spend time with you, Lord, to to pray with each other, Lord, that we would be spontaneous, Lord, in our fellowship, Lord. Lord, I pray that we find, yeah, that maybe we slow down our lives, Lord, so that we can have the opportunity and the energy to invite people into our homes, Lord, to share food, to celebrate life, Lord, and would see the extraordinary happen happen in the ordinary. And uh, so, Lord, I pray a blessing over everyone here today, for over the families. Lord, uh, we pray for the extraordinary in the lives of families. We pray for the extraordinary and uh, at youth group, at church, in the small groups, Lord, that we would be praying for each other, we would worship, Lord, that we would look to you and what you're doing. And, Lord, have the courage to step out um, and to share our faith with others. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like some prayer this morning, please do, do feel to come up. We'd love to pray for you. And um, stick around for a cup of coffee and chat. And uh, look forward to seeing you tonight. 7 o'clock, at the same time, we'll kick off. And uh, invite your neighbours, invite your friends. We believe there'll be a lot of people here, we believe. And we're just going to make that space in the middle. So we're changing it around. But um, enjoy it. And